Okay, we are all back, uh, ready to dive into First Corinthians. Okay, so uh, what we'll do is um, let's just read through the whole chapter once, um, and then we'll go into a verse by verse study, right? Okay, so um, if there's somebody who wants to read that chapter. First Corinthians chapter one, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and the Christians, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and us. Grace be unto you and peace from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given to you by Jesus Christ, that in everything E or enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that he, beh he come behind in no gifts, waiting for the coming of the of our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall also confirm you unto the end, that he may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, and that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you say, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptize in, in my own name. And I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them the that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that, in in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to co-found the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to co-found the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised had God chosen ye and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him or ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Jeffina. We'll... Uh... Just go into looking at uh, each verse and um, talk about 
some things that we are seeing Paul talk about and what we can learn from this. So Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Uh, we see here the use of the word called. So someone who is invited, someone who is appointed uh, by God himself uh, to be an apostle. So uh, the Greek there is um, apostolos, that is one who is sent, one who is delegated uh, as a messenger, as an ambassador, uh, to be a representative on behalf of somebody else. And so Paul has been sent by God to uh, represent himself before the people. Um, and we see a very clear uh, definition of who is the one who does the calling. Uh, the calling is done by God and by the will of God. Uh, it is not something that we uh, decide for ourselves. And it's not something that we can manufacture for ourselves. It is something that God ordains. And so when we are called into something, we can go with that uh, assurance that we are called by God, we are sent by God. And so God is the one who empowers us to fulfill that calling, uh, whatever our calling may be, whether uh, we are in business, whether we are in ministry, whether we are a homemaker, a pastor, a prophet, uh, we are in the corporate world, wherever we are, uh, if that is where God has called us, then we can go into it with confidence that he is the one who will empower us for that calling. And we see here the reference to uh, someone named Sosthenes. And so uh, in Acts 18, we read about uh, the synagogue ruler who was named Sosthenes, who was beaten up at that time. Uh, so it probably uh, is the same Sosthenes who had come to faith. And so here he is with Paul uh, uh, as he's writing. Uh, as Paul is writing the letter, uh, he's writing with Sosthenes. Uh, in verse 2, we see that the letter is written to God's church, right? That is an important uh, definition of the church. The church belongs to God. Uh, we may be the pastor, we may be a leader in the church, but the church still belongs to God. Um, and the church, uh, that Greek word ecclesia, is uh, those who are called out uh, and those who are uh, who assemble for a purpose that God has called them to. So they are called out of the world uh, and gather together to be a people set apart for God. Uh, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, right? Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be his holy people. Um, now, we see both the use of the church of God in Corinth. So there is that sanctified people and the saints, but they are very much present in the city of Corinth, which is known for its immorality. So uh, we, the holiness and that sin and immorality are kind of, um, they are opposites. They are almost like contrasted in that one statement. Uh, but that's what the church is called to be in this world. We are called to be the salt and light. So we're called to be the sanctified, set apart, holy people in uh, in the dark places that we are present in. Um, and we also see in that definition that Paul gives of the church, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be his holy people. Uh, both those words are talking about being set apart, uh, being sacred, uh, being consecrated. Um, and it's very, those are very important words that he's chosen to use when he's describing the church. Uh, because what we talked about, right, the culture, there was a lot of immorality in the culture. And even as we continue to read in Corinthians, we'll see some of that immorality has gone into the church and is being practiced in the church. So when Paul is using these words to describe the church, it's very intentional. Um, it's a very important description that he wants to give right at the start. 
this is who you are. You are a people who are holy. You are a people who are um, called to uh, be set apart from the culture uh, that you're in. You're called to uh, be consecrated to God. Um, and then he says, you're called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this church is part of the larger body of believers around the world. Uh, and the one thing that unites them is that Jesus Christ is Lord over the church. So Jesus Christ is Lord over the church at Corinth, and he's Lord over uh, the church around the world. And we can take, so that's why we can also take the words of uh, this letter for ourselves. Uh, this is not something that is written only to the Corinthians for that time. While there's very specific teaching from Paul to the situations that they were facing, there's much that we can learn and take from this letter for our present day uh, situation and our present challenges in the church. Uh, verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is using a standard kind of greeting. Uh, you'll see this in most letters that are written in the New Testament where there is this kind of greeting uh, where grace and peace or different words of blessing are spoken right at the start of the letter. And uh, what we can take away from this is those blessings come from God. Grace and peace come to us from God and from Jesus Christ. And even in those words, Paul is raising Jesus to the level of the Father. You see, uh, in the New Testament, there is constantly that revelation that Jesus is God, right? So um, teaching the church that Jesus is God, Jesus uh, was sent by the Father. And so when he says from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he's putting Jesus at the level of the Father. Let's go to, so that's the, the first three verses are an introduction to the letter, just uh, general greetings. And then we go into verse four. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Um, we see uh, Paul starting his letter with thanksgiving. Now, if you go on in this letter, there's going to be uh the major uh, portion of this letter, I mean, like 90% of the letter is correction, is uh, exhortation, is rebuke, is all of those things. But he starts his letter with a, on a very positive note. Uh, that is something for us to also learn that uh, no matter what is going wrong, there are things that are going well. And it's important for us to recognize the things that are going well. It's also uh, important to call those things out, whether it's in our own lives or in the lives of others, um, to be able to say, this is what I see God doing in your life. Uh, these are the amazing things that God has revealed to you. These are the amazing things that God is enabling you to do. Um, so often we can fall too much on the side of negativity where we forget uh, the good things that God's doing. We forget to give thanksgiving. We forget to uh, appreciate, honor what God is doing. Um, or on the other hand, we may ignore the things that need to be corrected and stay too much on the side of uh, just the praise. So uh, being able to praise God, being able to recognize the good things, and being able to also address the pro problems that are there uh, in the spaces around us, in the ministries that we are doing, uh, in the church, or wherever we are uh, given a place of authority or influence, to be able to address uh, the things that are also being done that are wrong. Uh, and uh, we see here also uh, the grace is given to you in Christ Jesus. That's very important. Uh, this grace is uh, something that is avail available to us because we are in Christ. Um, and it is in Christ that we are able to avail of all that is uh, all that is given to us as an in inheritance uh, through, through the gospel, through the cross. Uh, we're able to avail of it because we are in Christ. Uh, we also see um, a distinction between what 
uh, kinds of grace there is. So there is a general grace that is given to all believers. Uh, we see that in Romans 5.17. If someone can just read that. Romans 5.17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man offense death reign by one, much more the which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign, shall reign in life by one, by one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. So that grace is available to anyone who uh, receives this gospel, anyone who receives Jesus, uh, receives that abundant grace. But uh, there is also a special grace. So we say, so we see here because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. So there's a special grace that has been given to this church, to the church of Corinth. And we'll see more about what that grace is. Uh, but that kind of grace is available uh, for the specific calling that a person has or a church has or a community of believers has. Um, and that will be something that will enable them to live out their calling in the context in which they are. Um, so we'll just take one reference, Ephesians 4, 7. Can somebody read that, please? Ephesians 4, 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Thank you. So each one of us has special grace for certain things that God wants to fulfill through us. And uh, the Corinthian church had the same. It had a specific grace for their context, for what God wants to fulfill through them. Uh, and so even in our context, even in our callings, in our churches, uh, to recognize what is the grace that God has given us specifically uh, that we can uh, tap into, that we can exercise to fulfill uh, what God wants for us, uh, for our people. Um, verse 5 says, For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. So this is where Paul is expanding on what is the grace that has been given to them. He says, uh, you have been blessed with uh, all kinds of speech, with all kinds of knowledge. So those are the spiritual gifts that they have been given. Um, and uh, we understand that as the gifts of utterance and the gift of knowledge. Um, so uh, the gifts of utterance would be uh, in uh, speaking in tongues, interpretation, uh, and gifts of prophecy. So all of those involve speech, right? So they are all considered as the gifts of utterance. Uh, and gifts of knowledge or the revelatory gifts would be words of wisdom, words of knowledge, discerning of spirits. So these were the gifts that uh, were being exercised within this church. Um, and they were being practiced, they were being experienced by the people. And so this is a special grace that is upon them where uh, they are seeing um, their believers receiving these gifts and exercising these gifts in abundance. Now, we also recognize that these gifts are available to all of us as believers. Um, and so uh, this is something that we can uh, receive for ourselves. We can trust that uh, these gifts are available to us in Jesus uh, because God gives us that grace in Jesus. Right? Because we are in Christ, those gifts are available to us. But here we see Paul calling out these gifts specifically in this church. Uh, and as we continue to see in Corinthians, we'll see that uh, the spiritual gifts were being uh, exercised and being seen powerfully at work in this church. Uh, and we'll uh, also look at what does that mean? What does it mean to be able to see spiritual gifts being used so powerfully, being exercised so powerfully? Uh, and what can we understand about the faith of the Corinthians from it? Um, let's go on to verse 6. 
God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. So this is a, a really important statement. He's saying here, yes, we came to you with the gospel uh, and we preached the good news of Jesus and you believed. But what is the confirmation that what we said is true? The confirmation is that you have received these gifts and you we are able to see these gifts at work in you. So um, the evidence of the truth of our message is what we are seeing as the fruit in the believers who have received the message, uh, which is uh, a beautiful thing, right? Uh, that I don't have to prove the truth of my message. The truth of my message is proved in the fruit that is born in the lives of those who believe. Uh, it's um, It takes away the weight of um, us having to do something, us having to create something or make something happen. Uh, it, it brings us to a place of completely trusting in God, completely resting in God, and also to a place of complete dependence on God because this cannot be manufactured. Um, it, I can't make somebody um, exercise the gifts of the Spirit. I can't make somebody receive the gifts of the Spirit. It has to be the Holy Spirit moving. It has to be that person's heart changed. Um, it has to be that person receiving what is being given to them. And so uh, it is It is our task to just take the message, to take it uh, in obedience, to take it in faith that God will work through that message, and to take it in humility, knowing that uh, our job is just to carry the message. And that's all we can do. Uh, we can, we can, of course, pray uh, for the people who we are speaking to. We can um, pray for their hearts to be open, for their eyes to be opened. Um, but that evidence that our message is true and uh, the evidence that uh, that God has worked in their lives will come from what happens in their lives after we preach and after we share the gospel. Um, let's go on to verse 7. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. So uh, we see again this, um, what Paul is affirming in this church, that there is no lack of spiritual gifts. They are, they're seeing all the spiritual gifts being exercised, all the spiritual gifts um, were definitely made available to them, but we see that they are using those gifts and they are eagerly waiting for Jesus to come in that time of using their spiritual gifts. Verse 8 says, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus. So not only is uh, that living in the spirit important, but it's also important to remain firm to the end, uh, to remain blameless uh, before God when Jesus returns. Uh, and that... No, not only do the gifts come from God, but the ability to stand firm also comes from God. Um, God is faithful, verse 9. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so it is God who will keep this church standing firm. It's God who will keep us standing firm till Jesus Christ returns. Uh, so there are some things that uh, we'll just look at. So we see that Paul is affirming these gifts. He's recognizing that these spiritual gifts are at work. Um, but we also see that there were lots of problems in the Corinthian church. There was a lot of sin. There was a lot of uh, immaturity in the believers. So we can see that uh, Seeing the gifts of the Spirit does not mean that the believers are spiritually mature. Sometimes we can confuse that when we see somebody uh, using the gift of prophecy or we see someone being powerfully uh, used by God or powerfully revealing something that's supernatural, we think that they have reached a level of spirituality that maybe it's far beyond us. 
or um, they, that they have a greater maturity than us. Uh, but if we look at chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians, Paul calls these believers babies. He calls them carnal um, because um, they, although they had all of these gifts, they were still very immature in their faith. And we see that in evid evidenced in the way they were living, in the things that they were talking about, in the things that were dividing them. Uh, so they were quarreling about who they who they follow, which leader is better, all of these things that were least important, right? Christ is, uh, we see that uh, Paul affirms right at the start, Christ is Lord of the church, right? So, He's the only one we should be going after, and he's the only one we should claim allegiance to. So um, when we look at spiritual gifts, we should not equate that with spiritual maturity. Um, the other thing to see is that even though there was uh, this this uh, sin in the church, even though there were problems in the church, we can see that they were continuing to use their spiritual gifts. So one side of it is that just because there are problems, we shouldn't uh, say that, OK, there is there are these problems. Let us not use our gifts. Instead, we continue to use our gifts and continue to allow God to work in our lives. So we're continuing to. Uh, allow God to sanctify us, continuing to surrender ourselves to God while also using our spiritual gifts. We don't say, I'm going to reach this level of holiness and then use my spiritual gifts. Uh, we see that God will continue to work through us while also sanctifying us. And uh, the other side of it is that uh, not only spiritual maturity, but we cannot judge someone's holiness based on the use of spiritual gifts. Okay, so just because we see them using spiritual gifts, we don't uh, we don't say, okay, this person is very holy. They there is not there's no sin in them. That is not necessarily the case. Um, and also, this beautiful thing that Paul does is, even though he can see all of these problems, he can see all of this sin. He's saying, I trust God to hold you firm, to keep you standing firm till the day Jesus comes. Uh, so even though there are these problems, he doesn't lose hope for the church. He keeps, uh, he keeps speaking words of faith and confidence in God, not confidence in himself or the people, but confidence in God to uh, hold these people, to carry them through till the end. Uh, and the last part is that God has called us into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's verse 9. So God is faithful and he has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that is uh, the calling that each one of us has as believers and as the church, that we come into communion with the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So while this verse, verse 9, talk specifically about being called into fellowship with Jesus Christ. Uh, there are other verses. So we see it's in your notes. Um, we are called into fellowship with the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it mentions that. Uh, and 1 John 1, 3 talks about being called into fellowship with the Father and with the Son. So uh, we are called into communion, into friendship, into partnership, uh, into intimacy with all three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful thing to be called into this relationship of uh, love, of sharing, of, um, of oneness, right? We are made one with God. Okay, so far, any questions, any thoughts? Okay, Jeffina, you can go ahead. So uh, in verse 8, we see uh, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this, the day uh, signifies the judgment day or the second coming, uh, just to know what it actually signifies, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Uh, yes, so it refers to the the day when Jesus Christ will come back, the second coming. So um, this is basically when Jesus Christ comes back to call his bride, right? Uh, will we be part of that um, that bride, that spotless, uh, pure, uh, clothed in white bride? Um, that Jesus has come for will be we be part of that church, uh, and so that's when Jesus will call back the believers, those who have stayed firm to the end. Any other, anything else? Uh, questions or anything you want to share from what we've covered so far? Okay, we'll move on to verse uh, 10. Name of motive. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Uh, so here we see Paul's shift in the letter, right? So the first three verses were general greetings. Uh, the next five verses were just uh, being able to say what God has been doing in the church, being able to acknowledge the good work that God has been doing in the church. And, um, and then he goes into this mode of correction, of addressing things within the church that were not as they should be. Um, and he's doing that from uh, with the authority of Christ. So he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is who he is as an apostle he's sent uh, to represent god to the people and so he's going there in the name of jesus uh, and whatever he's saying is coming from that place and that's an important thing uh, it comes that his authority and uh, his responsibility is to jesus and he goes representing jesus uh, in his role as an apostle. So that's something for us to also remember. In the roles that we are placed in, we are going as representatives of Christ. So the things we are saying, whether um, things to correct, things to teach, whatever it is, um, that we are coming from that place of authority in Christ. And that's where our confidence is. So we can say what we have to say, uh, because we believe that that is the heart of Christ for that situation, for those people. Um, and so we shouldn't shy away from saying things that maybe wouldn't please people, uh, wouldn't be well received. We wouldn't do that because our allegiance and our um, accountability is to Christ. Um, so he says, all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. So there are a few things that he is describing about what uh, believers, a uh, community of believers should, uh, sh what should be seen within a community of believers or within a church. One thing is speak the same thing. So uh, whatever you are saying, let it be in agreement with one another. Uh, thing, whatever we are saying about God, whatever we are uh, saying about our faith. Uh, the second thing is let there be no division, nothing that uh, causes y'all to be uh, divided or anything that puts y'all on different sides. Y'all all are on one side. Uh, that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. So in the things that you are thinking, in the way you understand things, in the way you judge things, um, and then in the way you, um, in the opinions that you have, in the views that you have, let all of those things be perfectly united. So uh, like well knit together. Uh, so that is quite a tall order for a church, right? I mean, you have 
so many people in a church uh, with so many different views and say all of you say the same thing all of you uh, think the same way all of you have the same opinion is quite uh, it seems almost impossible but yet paul seems to think that this is not too much to ask of the church if he's asked if he's writing it to them he's saying it is possible it is possible in christ it is possible through his spirit um so how do we do that how do we uh, come to such a place of unity any thoughts Anyone Hello, want to share? Good, Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Please, I just want to ask a question from this uh, from this uh, teaching. You said that uh, we should have this, uh, we should speak the, the same thing. We should have the same mind. Um, but sometimes when we interpret the Bible, and the interpret is to give us different meaning. And uh, people used to say that uh, uh, Holy Spirit interprets the Bible in different way, in based on the circumstances and the uh, use on God. So now I want to ask: Is it possible for all the churches to to speak the same thing, have the same mind, and um, the same judgment based on the Word of God? Please, I want clarification. Yes. Uh, so I'll just repeat your question, and uh, if I, if you want to correct me, you can correct me. Uh, so your question is that we say that uh, the Holy Spirit will give us an interpretation of Scripture, and sometimes people interpret Scripture differently. So how do we come to a place of agreement and say the same thing and think the same thing? Did I? understand your question fully yes 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 ma'am yes so um so yes this is the challenge right so um i think uh, we are not in this uh, paul is writing to uh, to the Corinthians, and he's saying, you agree. So this is that small local church. Now, uh, that small local church has people in authority. So Paul is a person in authority who established the church. And then he has raised up leaders within the church. So those are the people who will help uh, help correctly interpret scripture. Um, but um, Everyone does have the Holy Spirit, and everyone does go to Scripture and receive revelation from uh, Scriptures through the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we should test those revelations. And so we test those revelations uh, by going through the rest of Scripture, by understanding uh, what does the rest of Scripture say about this, what does the context in this passage say about it? Uh, we will test all of those things, and uh, we will then come to a conclusion of what what does this mean, or what uh, what will we stand for, uh, what will we say is true, uh, and we will also submit to our spiritual authorities uh, as long so long as they are uh, also in line with what is, what is in scripture. So if we are able to do all of these things, there is much more uh, opportunity for unity. So we do our study. We receive from the Holy Spirit. We study the Word of God. We look at uh, what the Word of God says, whether what we have understood is in line with the Word of God. We learn from our spiritual authorities. And all of those things coming together, uh, then. Uh, brings us to a place of agreement. Is that does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah yes, ma. For some people used to argue some on some things like baptisms, like baptism, 
Some people believe believe in water baptism, while some people didn't believe in water baptism. So that's why I asked the question. Yes, yes. So this um, so that would be a question for the larger church, right? That is like uh, the church worldwide. Uh, but uh, now we are looking at a very specific, a small local body of believers, and he's saying you agree with one another. So uh, because there was division, and we'll see what cause of division was but he's telling them y'all don't be divided this small local body so we're not saying now we cannot uh, make the whole uh, church universal all agree on certain doctrine at this point in uh, where we are as a church uh, but as a local body of believers these are some practices we can follow to come to a place of unity uh, to be in agreement with each other. But uh, we'll see that what the Corinthians were fighting over was not great questions of theology. It was very, this is why Paul calls them immature, because uh, their debates were things that were actually of no importance at all. Um, and so when he's calling for unity, he's also saying, like, Y'all are being divided over very insignificant, unimportant things. These are not the things that uh, that you should be fighting over. These are not the things you should be clinging to. Um, and uh, we'll go on to see what these things are. Um, so verse 11, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Uh, verse 12, what I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. So here Paul has uh, described what the actual cause for division was. So they were fighting over the leaders in the church, people who had taken the gospel to them. Um, so Paul and Apollos had taken the gospel to them. Um, and so some of them had come to faith through Paul, some of them had come through Apollos. Uh, and so they were quarreling and saying, I follow one, you follow the other. And so that was causing division within the church. But uh, what the beautiful thing is that Paul calls them to unity in Christ, which is important. So you are not united under uh, a church leader, but you are united under Christ. Um, and we see that Paul received this report from someone named Chloe, uh, who was a part of the church. And so Chloe had taken that report back to, uh, or the house, people from the household had taken that report back to Paul. Um, so we talked about this earlier, where there were different people of different status within the church. And based on their status, they had a preference for a certain kind of leader, right? So if they were people of lower class, they would like Paul because Paul associated with them. He was uh, in the marketplace, he was doing manual labor, and they appreciated the work he was doing. They appreciated that he was uh, engaging with them, and so they would be the ones who would uh, want to follow him. On the other hand, Apollos, as we saw in Acts 18, was described as someone who is a great rhetorician. So he uh, would Speech powerfully, he had great knowledge. And so the people of the higher status would be the people who would have preferred Apollos. So you see that this division is actually not really based on anything that Paul or Apollos was teaching. It was based on status, right? So the people of the lower status who liked Paul were choosing Paul based on their status. And the people who liked Apollos were choosing Apollos based on their status because it uh, it appealed to the higher status mindset of uh, of great philosophy, great thinking, great uh, oratory skills, all of these things that they were pursuing almost as uh, sides of power. Uh, so 
Paul is actually addressing that kind of division within the church. It is uh, you're choosing leaders, but you're choosing leaders based on what is present in the culture. Uh, so the uh, when we see later on Paul talking about, uh, we'll go on in verse 18 and 19, where he's talking about the wisdom of the world. This was the wisdom of the world that was being seen in the church, um, where what was practiced in Corinth. Uh, that philosophy, uh, that practice of like being able to speak uh, very impressively, uh, and that being uh, appealing to people of a higher status or the elite in society, uh, was something that some of the people were following. Uh, whereas the people of the lower class liked Paul for their own reasons. So um, there was a problem with that kind of vision in the church. Uh, so Paul then goes on to say, is Christ divided? No, Christ is one. And so we should be one in Christ as the body of Christ. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Christmas and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So Paul is addressing that, uh, that desire of uh, some of the people to receive uh, like someone with great rhetorical skills to have somebody who is able to uh, be very Im impressive in their preaching so he's saying i didn't come to you with that kind of preaching uh, because i wanted the cross of christ itself to be uh, highlighted the power of the cross to be uh, highlighted i didn't want my words to take away uh, what was what is inherent in the cross. And so um, there was a reason for which Paul had chosen to preach in this way. Um, and then he's calling them back to Christ himself. So Christ is the one to whom you should, uh, you should uh, have an allegiance to Christ. It's not to a specific leader, but to Christ himself. So I think um, there are a few notes in your notes uh, that explain some of that. But all of it in the text is quite self-explanatory. So uh, our unity, our allegiance should always be to Christ himself, not to a leader. So if a leader uh, leaves the church, we don't leave the church. Or if a leader goes astray, we don't go astray with them. Uh, our unity will always be in Christ. Our allegiance will always be to Christ. And so uh, it is when we um, are aligned to Christ that unity within the body is uh, possible because we are all coming under the Lordship of Christ. So let's go on to verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So that um, the power of the cross is only understood by those who are being saved. So for someone who uh, is, is trying to understand the gospel just with their mind or with their logic, uh, it will sound like foolishness. It will not make any sense to them. Uh, why would God come and uh, die on a cross? How does that reveal power? How does that reveal uh, anything that I would want to follow? Why would I want to follow somebody who um, who ended up uh, being crucified on the cross? Uh, so if we try to explain the gospel in a way that is only logical, and if we are expecting people to come to faith through the logic of what we are saying, that is probably not going to happen. Uh, it has to be 
uh, spirit, Holy Spirit opening their eyes and the Holy Spirit enabling them to come to a place of faith and receiving what is the power of God in the cross. Uh, verse 19 for it is written i will destroy the wisdom of the wise the intelligence of the intelligent i will frustrate um, so that is a quotation from isaiah 29 i think that is not in your notes um, isaiah 29 verses 13 to 14. Uh, so this is verses 19 and 20 of uh, first corinthians 1 is referring to Isaiah 29 13 to 14 where Isaiah 29 is talking about those living by human tradition versus God's revelation and it says those living by human tradition will perish but those who live by God's revelation will uh, will be the ones who receive spiritual understanding so um I think the bell just went off. Uh, we'll stop there with verse 19 and we'll continue from verse 20 in our next class. Um, so until then, please do go into Google Classroom. Please uh, do post your learning, your insights and uh, post an introduction of yourself as well. Thank you so much. It was good to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma